will forewarn you that I'm going to make this a conversation after just a little bit of fear, because I really think there's some expertise in this room and some experiences uh, that, that I want to make sure I take advantage of. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Whit Stewart. I'm the Chief Extension Specialist at the University of Wyoming. I think everybody knows that in this room, but I, for formality's sake, should, should introduce myself. Um, I, I teach classes on campus, uh, two to three classes a year. We do a lot of research, and then doing today, what I'm doing, talking to you and visiting with you, is the highlight of my job. And so uh, with that, I think, let's just go around the room real quick, because I will be calling all of you as adjunct professors today so that we can have some conversation, because um, there's a couple of folks that, that, that I don't know. So let's start on this end of the room. Uh, Where are you from and your connection to the sheep industry? Okay. Uh, Cassie, I'm from Lander, and I work at the extension, and my husband studied sheep eight, three years? Two or three years, yeah. Okay. We do, uh, our kids do 4-H sheep, and then we started raising our own, or, or the kids kind of did. Nice. So we what, what breeds? Uh, black bays, Suffolk, mostly. Uh, and uh, we only got eight heads. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Last name? What, Weber. 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 Yep. And your first name? Matt. Matt. Welcome. So you were the one person that I didn't even know you were the family cast. So excellent. Great. Nice to meet you. Alicia. Um, Alicia Reps. We're up in Crow Park. Um, and we just met uh, just a youth. A motley crew of youth. And a wool. And I, I, left the, I left the waste wool, the bellies and tags um, for use as a garden. How do you color those stuff? Just through a pellet mill. Very simple. Just a normal run-of-the-mill pellet mill. <laughs> so a pellet mill that somebody would make grain pellets out of. Same thing. pellets. Absolutely. Same thing. Or yep. stove pellets, probably. Yep. But a little one. It's not very big. It's a 10-horse motor. Uh-huh. Um, the hopper is only about that big. I can pellet um, about 20 to 30 pounds an hour. And where are you marketing mm -hmm. that stuff? Well, on the internet, garden shows, locally. No, this is great. I've been taking my tags and plowing into my garden exactly. for years. Yep. <laughs> and and the, it works the same. The pellets just break down quicker. Well, the tags got a little manure with them. And they do, absolutely. <laughs> the, the dirtier the wool that I pellet, the better. It yeah. pellets better. Clean, yeah. clean wool doesn't pellet very well. We, we will talk about that because I think that the, there is research out there that shows it's a really good soil amendment. And mm -hmm. so we can talk about some of those. I wanted to, I, I prompted that because I think there's some real opportunity for partner folks here in the room. Glenda. I'm Glenda Lubitschka. We have just a little bit of a small background. Pete Caracaburo. I grew up on a sheep ranch in southwestern Wyoming. And since then, I've lived in Buffalo, Ranchester, and Riverton for 40 plus years. And I've been raising my own flock of sheep since then. And I live here on Missouri Valley Road. And I summer my herd on the Bighorn Mountains above Densley for the summer. Targies? Targi. 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 But I have some merino blood in my sheep because back in the late 80s and early 90s, I was importing merino semen from New Zealand and artificially inseminating my sheep as well as some sheep for the Mikey Ranch in KC. So I've got a dose of merino. But since then, since I quit doing AI, I've been pretty much strictly targeted. I need to get some fleeces from you, Dr. Pete, so I will, I will maybe uh, have a conversation with you after. Yes, for our wool dip. My name is Allie Etzinger, and we're, my husband and I are privileged to mentor under Dr. Pete and his operation and, and absorb all that he's willing to impart to us. So we have. They own part of the herd of it. That's part of the deal. Right? Allie and Ben. Yep. yep, that's near. And we've been we've been privileged to work for Dr. Pete for about five, six years. That's awesome. What a good mentor. Liz. Um, my name's Liz Kilt and I'm from I grew up out of Farside, but now I live in Spring Valley where we have a farm. We have a ranch at Farsight. And we summer some sheep there on Copper Mountain and I, I guess 
Mom and dad were an absolutely <laughs> lovely Scottish people. <laughs> Just lovely. Some of my favorites. Uh, and, and Liz, you are lovely also. <laughs> right? <laughs> but but you're, you're running throughout the Ramblin' West and yeah. things. Yeah. Very cool. Great. Because they flock together. So. <laughs> they yeah. try to go around the woods too much. <laughs> In a range environment. Everyone introduce themselves because I think. Uh, oh, we, we got to go to the back here. <laughs> yep, you're not getting out of this. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Jen Horton. I'm the Fremont County 4-H educator, um, and I'm married to Shay Horton, so we have cattle, but you know, not a personal connection to the sheep, but to help, you know, I'm on the 4-H side. I have an interest in stuff like this. You can always learn something even though if it's a different species. So. Absolutely. Uh, I'm Dave Montgomery. I'm an ag extension educator. Dagan's a part of our newly formed Sheep Task Force, which is a group of sheep uh, extension educators throughout the state that uh, are collaborating more closely on sheep programming. And so um, what I'm going to do to keep this fluid, because there's a lot of things I want to cover um, today, and I have 40 minutes-ish? Okay. I think what, what I wanted to come with today was talking about some nutritional principles that I think are effective. I think in the past, like last week I spoke in Evanston, and we had all of our large range sheep operators there. I had a couple farm flock folks. So I, I really took the, the range sheep nutrition angle. I'm gonna make this more fluid because I know that we have a, a broader mix here, to, here today. And so um, I know that you've heard me talk a lot about minerals in the past. You've heard me talk about uh, nutritional, gestational nutrition, but I think I wanna hit some reminders, but then I wanna shift gears and talk about some enterprise benchmarking work we've been doing. I've got some market report slides if that's what we want to talk about. I will talk about minerals. Dr. Pete shared with me a mineral package that we have helped uh, with some of the research we've done, making sure it's the right kind. So with that, um, before we get overly conversational, I just want to highlight a couple of things that when I think about nutrition, I can make a penny scream, and I think good nutritional education emphasizes a cost-effective nutritional strategy. And, and when I say precision, that's the term I use to say welcome. Um, not to say welcome, but welcome. Uh, <laughs> that's the term I use to say we want to meet those specific nutrients at the time they need it the most. Because when we overfeed a nutrient, obviously it's not being partitioned towards production. That is an inefficiency for us. Now I realize that how we manage our sheep isn't always that precision in some cases. But really, I'm taking the angle of what's our least uh, our least expensive feed resource, and how do we make sure that we're supplementing adequately to meet those stages of production when they just need more? Um, and so one thing that I, I really think is special about sheep production is we have a livestock species that we ask them to do the most work under the most challenging conditions on this earth, okay? The climatic conditions they face, the quality decline that they face during the time of the year when there is little grass and it's low quality, um, we really work with a livestock species that has been programmed to thrive under the most challenging environments. Welcome, Mark. Um, and, and so, again, this precision nutrition, it varies how you deliver the feed, it varies what feed resources you have, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about requirements as we get into this time of the year. The first thing I wanna highlight here, and I know you're gonna see these tables and you're saying, Whit, don't kill me with graphs and tables, but this is a good one, okay? Um, some work done in the 70s really showed what are the caloric expenditures of sheep that are raised in a farm flock scenario versus those that are traveling out on winter range and everything in between. So these two columns behind me looks at the caloric expenditures they have per day and what we would consider a house system or a dry lotted system in a farm flock kind of situation compared to that in a rangeland or more extensive situation. And when you look at all those activities, and I stand out of the way here, 
uh, when you think about just the basic activities that we undergo and our sheep undergo on a daily basis, nothing is a free lunch. Everything has a metabolic cost, okay? And so thinking about just standing and walking, right? Uh, standing, a, a sheep in a house system is going to have about six kilocals per day expended just standing, and its tissues and its lungs respirating, there's a cost there, okay? Contrast that to uh, standing in a grazed environment where there may not be a windbreak. Uh, th there are differences, and there's differences in things that we don't always account for. Um, thinking of just about the big difference, right, is an animal out on range, maybe in Liz's scenario, uh, traveling, expending those calories, has a much higher requirement than an animal that has the feed brought right to it or has a, has a residue that they don't have to travel uh, significantly throughout the day. When you look at this, this roughly 30% difference between these two systems, we realize that our nutritional program and your operation should be dynamic and different enough that you are accounting for the conditions in your environment. One thing that I, I've talked with producers a lot, because as I, I have the privilege of working with sheep operations throughout the state and region, I work with producers that are raising hair sheep that have mature body weights of 112, 115 pounds. And then I'm working with other producers out on range that have ewes that weigh over 230 pounds, okay? Uh, the effect of body size and the consequent effect on metabolic function is really pronounced. So on your sheet of paper and your notes there, I give you just kind of a, a simplistic uh, comparison of a 157 pound ewe, which she requires at various stages of production, and then a large ewe that's closer to 200 pounds. And again, I know this is death by PowerPoint, but let me just draw your attention to some of these pictures. This little percentage there, it's the percentage difference between um, how much feed those animals require on a dry matter basis, so how much they could eat differently. So you can tell here is we're in maintenance or right after weaning when we're not asking that you to do a whole lot. And as we move into breeding and pregnancy and, and, and lactation, you start to see those differences really, really diverge, okay? I think the first step, again, and it's not to ever diminish your knowledge because you folks are the experts out in the field, but I will often ask this question, what's the average body size in your youth? And you would be amazed how many people underestimate that on a, on a, a frequent basis. And if we're in a situation where that animal is not able to get any of its feed intake on pasture, and you have to bring all of its, its feed and substitute all its feed, uh, it's really important to account for that percent of its body weight and to make sure that you're feeding it the right amount, okay? Because body size does matter. Are there any questions about this real quick? No? So what is the average body size of our use? Don't be afraid. What, where are you at? If you're being tackled by one, it feels like 300. <laughs> <laughs> when they're running through you, yeah, it feels like 600 pounds, yeah. Ours are about 180 pounds, okay, and what kind, what kind of genetics? Mainly rambolite. Rambolite, yeah. okay. So th this, this is a conversation that I've had speaking to purebred groups. There's a lot of selection in indexes out there now in some of our white, white face sheep breeds that put some negative pressure on the sheep getting too big. And we could talk about how, many, how much pounds of lamb do we need to produce to offset these differences. I'm not going to go into that today, but just suffice it to know that, that mature body size really does matter. Now, I know there's tables here, please bear with me. Going back to a more moderate view, I put a 154 pound view here. I know there's not many of those out there left in the country. But throughout different stages of the year, you can see that a different percent of body weight is required in their total feed intake. We just talked about that. When you look under the, the columns that say TDN, which stands for total digestible nutrients, that's the energy that we have in our feeds. You submit a feed sample to the lab, they'll give you back a TDN estimate. Okay? So those are pounds of TDN required at those various stages, and then pounds of crude protein. Okay? And I'm going to assume uh, this particular scenario, this ewe is carrying twins. We know that not all ewes in our flock are carrying twins. But as you think about, one, are you testing feed on a regular basis on your operation? And two, being able to test that feed and calculate some of these requirements is really helpful to make sure that as a baseline you're providing those nutrients. Um, I, I was going to talk a little bit about flushing, and, and, and I'm just going to skip ahead and talk about some of the things I've observed as I've worked with people that flush their sheep. 
Flushing, you're talking to a cattle group, they think we're talking about embryos. I think most of us in here know that when we say flushing in a sheep context, it's increasing that plane of nutrition before breeding and into the breeding season so that we have an increased ovulation rate and therefore uh, hopefully more lambs born. I, I think that flushing should be based on what feed resources you have. And I know that some of us, flushing can, can look like us taking our lambs to a meadow versus off the foothills where they have more abundant feed and it's a little higher quality. Marvin, uh, you could flush on your crop residue, I imagine, in some cases, okay, uh, on some of your aftermath. But in many cases, when we think about how metabolically effective flushing needs to be, there's a difference. And I took an example of corn versus an alfalfa cut. When you look at the energy content of corn, it's about 88% total digestible nutrients. Very calorically dense. Lots of starch in there. Gives lots of energy to be used. That is, that is a gold standard, or, or a similar small grain would be a really good effective energy source for flushing. Because flushing is all about the energy that you producing more glucose uh, through your liver and, and, and telling the reproductive organs, oh man, I'm ready to breed. I have the nutrients to do so. When you compare that 90% corn or 88% corn to a 61% alfalfa pellet, again, a good feed, lesser energy dense in that alfalfa pellet, won't have necessarily the same energetic efficiency when you're flushing the ewe. Um, the other thing to think about when we think about what should I flush, you know, the, the, the thought of flushing is if I get a 10 to 30% increase in the number of lambs born, a pound of corn a day is well worth the investment, right? But sometimes we forget that the ewes that respond to that flushing treatment are only the ones in our flock that are average or slightly below average, okay? You can't nutritionally trick a ewe into ovulating more if she's, she's already over-conditioned, okay? And so many of us would say, Whit, I'm not going to go ahead and sort out those, those thinner ewes to flush. I'm just not going to do it. Well, I wouldn't disagree with you, but in years where the cost of a flushing diet is more expensive, and if you know that only a proportion of the flock is going to respond to that treatment, why not sort them off and feed them separately? Uh -huh. So, uh, you know, we, we collect this data at the University of Wyoming, right? You can imagine that we don't manage our ewes to be uh, super economical, and that's not a, a, a dig at state government. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that uh, our sheep are fat. And so in most years, uh, we don't we don't flush, it doesn't have the bang for the buck. But I've worked with a lot of producers um, that they'll sort off that 20% of their flock that on a body condition score of one to five, they're sitting at a two and a half, slightly below average. They will sort those use off, flush those, and they will see an increase in the Any questions about that? Any thoughts about that? Is there anything else to do when you flush? So, you know, we we get a lot of advice from Ivan, but we've been doing the uh, Kisplex mineral block too. Um, we, we've been doing more of that actually than the uh, than the grain. Um, is that is that something? Great question. I'm so glad you asked it. So one of the challenges we have with with those lick tubs or those high energy they're called high energy lick tubs is they they have to eat a lot of that sugar to equal the same amount a pound of corn would be. Right. So. Think about what's the target intake on one of those tubs. I think they say what, uh, 10 ounces a day or something like that is what they should be eating on one of those tubs. Is that kind of? I don't know. Well, I, I'm guessing, but it's close to that, right? 10 ounces a day of a 90% sugar versus a pound of corn where nine tenths of it is, is pure energy, right? The corn is always going to be the better energy supplement. Now, I will say this on the lick tub, um, I like lick tubs. For certain parts of the year as a mineral supplement because you get a little bit better uniform consumption now this is a rule of thumb right that that flavoring agent in that lick tub the sheep love it and so you don't have a lot of sheep in your flock that that under consume right you're making sure that you're everybody's getting something but from an energy supplement those lick tubs do very little very little so and again i, I don't know what the cost of the lick tub is because i talked to the grower a large range sheep producer down in the Eviston area. And he said, I've got a, a flock of 200 that I produce all of my rams and my replacements from. And he says, I cannot get them to eat my granular mineral. I said, have you tried this one or that? But he has, he has convinced himself that he does not want to mess with the granular mineral. 
And so we looked at lit tubs and I said, okay, here's the difference in price between these two products. And when we calculated that way, he said, okay, I'm only gonna buy enough for three weeks and I'm gonna do it right as they come into the pre-drop lot before I start lambing and that's what I'm gonna do. And then I'm gonna switch off of it. So I share that story with you only to be like, we can be adaptive. Um, I'm gonna talk about a mineral package that I really like, some of the research we've done to, to help some of our feed manufacturers have a more accurate mineral package. But before I move away from flushing, I'll just say this. If, if you are used to having a really high lamb crop in your flock and you have genetics that are producing 100, and, I'm just gonna say 180% drop rate, right? Come out of the shed. Versus somebody who only is used to 140% drop rate, chances are you, if you're producing at a high level, your flushing treatment is not gonna have as much an effect as if your production potential is a little bit lower. The point being, a lot of work has been done looking at breeds that are really high in ovulation rate, that have, have genetics that give them lots of land. And they have shown that those respond less to a flushing treatment than breeds that have a, a, a lower production potential in terms of flushing. And I know that sounds counterintuitive, but this figure right here shows some of this data, um, the, the dramatic effect of flushing on some breeds like the Cooper and the Suffolk uh, is much greater than the polypay, which has already been programmed and bred to produce a lot of lambs, okay? So the point being, we make these decisions based on economics, and we make them saying, what's gonna have the most bang for the buck? I'll say this just real quick, the ram. <laughs> you wanna talk about a time of the year where I'm seeing rams coming out of some of our range flocks, and I think, boy, those rams, they've lost some condition. And, and I, I have a picture of one of our black face rams in one of the visits I've made. Sometimes we just think feeding the ewe a little bit more energy, the ewe is the only one that matters. But a lot of cool work has been done where if you feed a half a pound to three quarters of a pound of grain to the ram, his, his circulating levels of reproductive hormones, so luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, and then testosterone, those, those hormones that drive his libido, those increase dramatically even with just short term energy supplements. The point being, uh, we've all seen our, our black-faced rams wander. Have, have us, have we, we've seen our black-faced rams, rams lose condition in our range flock. But they really lose their sex drive when they start losing a ton of condition. And so that energy supplementation really, really is important, um, especially on the ram side as well. So I know we're all kind of past this. Almost all of you have already bucked up. You're probably done. But I, I remind you of that just because Nutrition is one of those things that just that has more return on investment than any other part of our enterprise. And so when we're doing it right, uh, I think it really has a huge, huge thing for us. You're all aware that our twin bearing ewes and even our triplet bearing ewes have a higher protein than energy requirement. Uh, I won't spend a ton of time because you've heard me talk about this for years now, but I will say this is that um, as we get into that last 45 days of pregnancy, especially as I have seen working with lots of flocks in our region, our twinning rate has gone up historically. We've done a lot of research on that. We have seen an increase in the genetics that are giving us more twins and triplets. With that, it comes at a cost. And those, those, those proportions of our flock, of those, those ewes that are carrying twins and triplets, we have to make sure that especially in those last 45 days, we're giving them that extra energy. And because I'm an academic on campus, I, I sometimes forget that rule of thumbs are really the best way to go on everything. A half to three quarters pound of a supplement during the last 45 days of pregnancy, it's something that can be degraded quickly in the rumen. Uh, byproducts, barley, wheat, mid, corn, peas, that don't take a lot of time for that to be absorbed and circulated are a really good option for you, a half to three quarters of a now the exception being if your sheep are already obese, and I don't want to accuse anyone of having fat sheep here. Right? I, already, I already confess that we have fat sheep at the university. I would just say that we can avoid a lot of those metabolic diseases like ketosis, uh, milk fever, or pregnancy, or uh, hypocalcemia. A lot of those challenges that you see in the last part of pregnancy can be avoided just by giving a little bit more energy. And the reason why we have these issues where our ewes go down, how many of us have had a ewe go down with pregnancy toxemia or sugar sickness, maybe that's another common term, right? You've all had them, right? 
Let me ask you this, because I'm going to be vulnerable here and say, how many of you have been able, once they've gone down, to get them up immediately and solve the problem with 100% accuracy? With 50% accuracy? 25%? <laughs> I've had one. 10? <laughs> 10%. 10%. Okay, all right. Thank you, Dr. B. So what I'm trying to say here is an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Let's not let our use get in that state, okay? And the reason why, and, I, and I, we're doing a lot of work with this right now, really fun research project. We're collaborating with the U.S. Meat Animal Research Center in Nebraska that has these breeds that are giving quads and triplets to the majority of the flock. And we're looking at how their metabolism changes during pregnancy, right? Um, and, and the reason why we have these issues is this image there on the right. Is that, as those lambs grow inside that ewe, they really start putting pressure on that room and space. And all of that fermentation vat, you start cutting in, in, in half or you reduce it by a third. So that you just can't eat enough to extract the energy in her room. And so, um, you know, this, this, this figure right here isn't some of our data, but it shows as we get to that 120, 130 days of pregnancy, boy, that rumen volume really starts getting restricted. And that's why feeding a half to three quarter pounds of a supplement doesn't take up a lot of bulk space in that rumen. And, that, and actually can, can be a real game changer for that you. Um, which ewes are most predisposed to getting these metabolic diseases? Tell me. All right, skinny ones, yes, yes. Triplets. Triplets for sure, right? Because 60 to 70% of the glucose that you is producing in her liver is immediately shuttled across the placenta to that lamb. 60 to 70%. I mean, you ladies in the room know this, but man, Pregnancy is, is, is one of the most miraculous things. And the ability for that you, that you in this situation to prioritize those growing fetuses is, is, is amazing. But that being said, the reason she goes down is because they're giving everything they got to those lambs. And um, I would just, I would say the other exception that I have seen, you said skinny use, right? Let's not let them get to that, that condition. Uh, if they are in that condition, there may be something else going on triplet bearing ewes, and how many of you are ultrasounding your sheep to know who your triplet carriers are? Not many, and that's not, not picking on you, that's what I've seen across the industry. Um, so maybe looking at their weight gain as a, as a proxy of saying, okay, if this ewe is gaining that much weight during pregnancy and she still looks rough, maybe she's one that I need to separate and feed a little bit differently. That's a practical way of looking at it. But the other thing is fat. We're seeing more of this too. Ewes that maybe haven't had a lamb in a year, they have shown some liver dysfunction where they can accumulate that fat, they try to mobilize it from the system, but it starts building up in their liver and they can't turn it into energy, okay? Um, so, so they have metabolic dysfunction. You're saying, well, she's fat, she shouldn't be undernourished. Well, if she's fat and doesn't have the way to mobilize the fat, we see it in those, those instances as well. So you're saying you just described every instance under the sun, right? Yeah, that's the problem with metabolic disease. I will say this, if you are seeing it in more than 5% of your flock, we should visit about a different nutritional plan. Because we're seeing it increase over time as we're seeing more triplets born, but we shouldn't really see it up to 5%. It should be one or 2% max in our flock. But if it's getting up there, we should visit and we can look at our nutritional plan a little bit. So I've talked about pregnancy toxemia. Um, I said a half a pound to three quarters of a pound of, of supplement. I promised you I wouldn't lecture at you forever. And I've got how long? Got 10 minutes. 10 minutes, all right. Well, let me just end on this note on the, on the nutritional side. Um, how much indigestible fiber in our hay goes back to that feed restriction or goes back to that inability of you to eat enough to, to really produce enough energy to grow those lambs? I know that that when I see something like NDF, which is neutral detergent fiber, those represents the portion, that measurement is a fiber analysis that, that we get back after sending it to the lab that says how much of that fiber is digestible. The lower the NDF, the better on our feed, our feed report. I've shown you a little bit of the NDF concentrations of some different types of feed, and I've taken these from producers like you. Mature alfalfa, we think, wow, it's green, it's lush. It has a much fiber, higher fiber content than even a, a medium quality metal hay. Because okay? the fiber component of that alfalfa stem is much less digestible than the metal hay. 
So when you think about, I know you all know this, so I, I, I'm not, I, I acknowledge that you do. An earlier cutting hay, or I'm sorry, a later cutting hay um, is a way to reduce that fiber. I think a really good source, if you have access to this, are our wheat byproducts. Wheat mids are an excellent source of digestible fiber. Soy hulls are just not that, that common in our area, but that is a, a great, great piece as we get into late, late gestation and even into lactation. Um, all right, let's talk about this mineral real quick, and then I promise we can talk about some other things. Um, we've done a lot of work with our range flocks throughout the state, and, and as the, you get to these tables, because everyone's going to take these notes home, thank you for printing these for me. <laughs> thank you for printing them in color, too. Um, we, we just got this study published, and we have been sampling across the state. Liz was a part of this study. Was anyone else a part of this, our range flocks? We went to all our winter ranges, uh, 26 ranches across the state of Wyoming, uh, sampled every individual plant species on winter range, Pulled a fecal sample to determine what kind of grasses these, these, these uh, sheep are eating across winter range. And we went back and did all this analysis to say, where are you short on minerals? Where are you short on protein? Okay? And what we determined is we sampled all these operations, and I hate to just condense it down into one simple statement because we spent a lot of time on this, is that the more shrubs you have on your winter range, the more complete the mineral diet of your year. Shrubs are probably the least appreciated winter feed resource out there. And I know that some of us maybe don't winter in that environment, but as we've sampled and we've said, okay, what are the main causes of concern? We, thought, we saw like up in the Gillette country, these restored rangelands with the crested wheatgrass, which we all love to hate crested wheatgrass. We love it for about 60 days and then we hate it the rest of the year. Those, those grass monocultures provide very little minerals, very little whatsoever. And as we saw the proportion of the diet increase with shrubs, we saw that, that there were some operations that hadn't been supplementing, and they were unable, the way they were able to get around not supplementing was because they had so many shrubs out there. So what are the ones that, that, that we have done a lot of work with that I'm gonna pivot real quick and talk about a, a mineral package that isn't good, but when you look at this again, um, just know that these are some of the results of the research. The more grass uh, you had, the less minerals you were getting, uh, the more mixed and plant diversity you have, the better. But let's talk about, real quick, some of what these minerals look like. I'm gonna, this is gonna be a, a little activity real quick. We'll go ahead and you, it'll probably be on your later pages, go to this slide right here. And I don't know if I included it in your package. Okay, it's not in there, all right. Good, good professor move on my part. It's there, it's not. Yes. Got one right here. So, oh, I, got a, I got a text last week from a grower. He said, I'm buying some more alfalfa pellet from my company in Billings area, or Miles City area. And uh, you can see right here, I know it's hard to see, it says uh, three to one range mineral Montana a supplement for beef cattle. Okay? He said, How much of this should I add to this cake that I'm having, my, ha having to make for my use? Okay, so a couple of things. When you're reading a feed tag, and again, I, I know we know this, when you see beef cattle on the tag, you just walk the other way, okay? Or say, talk to me when you get a sheep mineral. <laughs> the study that we've done so much work on on winter range and then determining how much of a certain mineral these, these mineral packages should say on the feed tag is that cattle are not um, good proxies for sheep mineral, right? Uh, and, and the first thing to keep in mind is that the copper, right? The copper, we've all heard of copper toxicity in sheep. Sometimes we, do, we talk too much about copper toxicity. But the requirement for sheep is around 15 parts per million. One five, okay? This mineral tag right here has 2,500 parts per million, okay? So reason number one, you don't use a cow mineral. Now, there's certain breeds of sheep that are less susceptible to copper toxicity, and that would be our western white face range type sheep. Generally speaking, they are much less copper susceptible. Our black face are more susceptible. The worst copper toxicity case you're ever gonna see will be in a Texel. And does anyone raise Texels in here? They're cool little sheep, but they, they have zero hepatic tolerance for, for copper. So what is a good mineral? Okay, I, I think we get the point here. Don't use a beef cattle mineral. Um, I think a good mineral 
and thank you, Dr. Pete, for bringing this. Uh, one is going to say sheet mineral, but as you jot down a couple of notes to think about, uh, a good sheet mineral, no matter what environment you're running in, should never have less than 6% 6 phosphorus. Okay? That's kind of a catch-all. So as you see on a feed tag, you're going to say see some minimum analyses there and percentages. Shouldn't be less than 6% phosphorus. I like to see a true range mineral, and not, not those of you running in a more uh, irrigated farm, farm flock environment, 8 to 12% phosphorus. Phosphorus was one of those glaring deficiencies we saw a lot. The other thing I'm going to point out, because we've done a ton of work with it, is zinc. Okay? I'll spare you, and I, there is some literature in the handout, but we've determined that, guess what, not all sheep breeds are the same. If they have a higher production potential, more lambs born, shear a heavier fleece of a finer caliber, they require a lot more zinc than what even the textbooks were saying to us about eight years ago, okay? So I'm gonna tell you, zinc is a really important one as we go through pregnancy. Um, those of you that have had a cold before or taken some of those supplements, you'll see on the label zinc. Zinc does a lot of things physiologically, but it should be around 5,000 parts per million on your mineral, okay? You also wanna see your mineral have your vitamin D3, Okay, uh, vitamin D is synthesized in the skin or it's made on the skin of the sheep. This time of the year, at this latitude, with this much wool, they don't produce enough of it. They need it, they need to supplement it, okay? Um, vitamin D is really important, vitamin E is important, and then if you're running kind of in the foothills area or, or close to, you're cropping your hay, uh, close to about the range, I'd say selenium should be no lower than 30 parts per million, okay? So, Zinc should be over 5,000, your selenium should be over 30 parts per million, and your phosphorus should be at least over 6%. Now let me say this because I do have one of my fellow administrators in the room. I promote no one product over another. Did you everyone hear that? Okay. <laughs> However, when the feed company reaches out to us and say, let's talk about the recent research. I know you looked at this 50 years ago, but guess what? Sheep are not the same as they were 50 years ago. When we work with those companies and they change their products, I am going to recommend them. Okay. So one of those products is this Mormon's Weather Master uh, 625CW. Okay, um, a good. If you want to take a photo of this at the end of the program, this is a really good granular mineral. But what I will say about the importance of you monitoring how much they eat is that there are flavoring agents in every mineral package. Even if the meat salesman says there isn't, there is. And sheep, someday when I can retire, when I teach sheep how to read this label, but they don't know how to read and they're going to overeat a mineral. And so you can keep putting out a mineral and you can assume, well, they just need more and more and more. This will tell you how much they should be eating. So this particular package, feeding directions are three quarters to uh, one and a quarter uh, pound per head per month. So you could do that math and say, okay, if they've eaten up a mineral and they're continuing to eat more and more, I'm gonna make sure that I'm just not giving it to them cafeteria style. I may feed a week on and a week off, but the cost of, of feeding a mineral year round, I did a little analysis for you to look at. Again, with the principle that mineral supplementation year round is the gold standard, it is important, okay? What they don't get from the pasture or the feed, you need to supplement. But I have seen this, and I've seen it too often, that if you are gonna pay attention to when you supplement a mineral, it's during breeding, it's during pregnancy, and it's during lactation. Because everything they eat during pregnancy is going to be shuttled across that placenta, with some exception. It's gonna accumulate in the colostrum, okay? So good mineral supplementation means that the lambs are born with adequate minerals. So pregnancy is the gold standard. I am gonna say this, and I'm gonna say it, the dry period, or when that ewe has weaned her lambs, that is the time of the year where we, generally speaking, do not need to be putting out a mineral. Now the exception being white salt is required in greater levels year round, but that white salt is less than a penny a pound compared to that $1,600 a ton. Maybe not a penny a pound, but you get my point. Penny or head. So we've got the year-round routine supplement, supplementation, which comes out to about $18.20 a year. That's based off of kind of a premium product in our region. And then we have the time of the years where that you needs it the most, and the rest, 
rest of the year, the requirements just don't dictate it a whole lot, there's a $10 savings there, okay? Now this is back of the napkin math, but when you hear me say you can save $10 a you, I hope that resonates with someone, right? Like I said, I can make a penny screen. I took some apples and some oranges from the hotel, okay? And that is my snack, okay? So the point is, is our inputs today and into the future are going to be a constraint to sheep industry. You're all aware of that. You write the checks. But when we think about minerals during pregnancy, especially, that is the time of year where we get more bang for our buck. Yes? When I think my sheep are eating too much of that mineral too fast, I mix it half and half with salt. Is that okay? Okay. Um, that is a great point, Dr. P. So I will say alternating when you cut it in half with some white salt. So your mineral is formulated correctly at the rate when it's not diluted with white salt. However, if you fed straight mineral for one week and you fed a cut mineral where you're mixing it with half salt for two weeks, that would be my recommendation. Okay? Yeah, and that's about what I do. Is that what you're doing? Okay. Yeah. Otherwise, they love that stuff so much yes. that yes. You know, I can put out two sacks of that in two different tubs and that 350 can use will clean it out in a day and a half. And I, I don't know what, can I ask you, Dr. P, what you're paying a ton for mineral right now? Oh, I, I was paying $32 a sack. I just got a new uh, uh, pallet that he hasn't provided me the bill yet, but it's going to be more primarily, you know, trucking puts a huge pressure on the price of all of this stuff. So if I end up paying $36, $38 a sack, that's not going to surprise me. Well, I think, and thank you for sharing that, I think right now the mineral I quoted was $1,600 a ton. When I did this same analysis about seven years ago, it was $850 for a comparable mineral. So last, last March I paid $1,800 for 45 sacks. That pallet had 45 cents. This year it's got 40 cents, so I don't know. What so it's that's, that's, that's ballpark. I mean, that's ballpark. Yeah. Yeah. And that is a good mineral. Now, how about the mineral that Hubbard has produced that the guys in Buffalo are buying? Peter John Trevino. What do you know about that mineral? Is that a comparable so, mineral? Okay, yes. So I like Hubbard. Uh, we worked with them, similar to ADM, which is the parent company of this, this product. And for a while, they were feeding the right amount. Something happened and they defaulted to those lower levels again. Um, so, so this this is what I will offer up to you. Is you are, there are some, there's some good minerals out there, but there are some bad minerals out there. Most of you have my cell phone in here, and I know you, you may think that I don't get back to you right away, but I do eventually, right Ivan? Yes? Yes. Okay. So so you can take a picture of that mineral and I could I can tell you whether it's it's a good mineral or not. And that keeps me out of trouble from saying, oh, this is the company that I like to use. Uh, so so I'm offering that up there. But yeah, I think what's interesting about the sheep industry and working with good companies that are committed to the sheep industry is that we don't have the volume as as cattle, right? They can sell a lot of cattle product pretty pretty easily. We have a specialized animal that requires more, and so we got to make sure that we work with companies that that are are honoring our species. Right? This comes out of Quincy, Illinois. Yeah, this That's company is yeah, ADM. Yeah, they they've all consolidated so much it's different. So I I just want to mention briefly, and I said I was going to lecture you. I am going to stick around for a while. So please, questions? Let's visit. We have some surveys that we will get printed at some point for you. I'm sorry, I didn't bring them. I know you're hearing me talk about this a lot. If you've already participated, and some of you have, we're compiling information to better understand what should be your production costs at your scale of operation. What should be your production compared to your peers in your area in terms of culling rate, percent open use, weaning percentage, your costs. When you go to a banker, and we're hearing a lot of this from, from young producers wanting to get in the industry, their banker calls me, or the F FSA person, and says, what should I be assuming in terms of total productivity? 
this young person says they have a plan they can get into business, how do I check to see if they're accurate? And how do I know if his costs are enough? So, so we've been collecting this data. Again, you don't put your name on the survey. It's a written uh, survey. But here's some of the preliminary results as we're compiling this information. I know how competitive all of you are. And you don't talk about competitive with each other. You're going to the south, southwest corner of the state. Oh, my goodness gracious, man. I'm not a competitive person. Uh, but they are. And so, so this represents uh, 28 responses, and this is kind of taking the small operations and the big operations. Once we have enough survey responses, we'll break it up into categories, saying if you run two to 500 head, this is what your production levels, should, the median production levels or the high, high levels should be. So we, we've asked some of these questions. What's the number of open or dry news that, that don't breed up on your enterprises on a given year? Uh, the average has been around 4.2% from our survey data. We've seen upwards of 10% in some of these operations, okay? What was your culling rate, okay? The average is about 10.86% uh, was the average annual culling rate of some of the use uh, in, this enter in this data that we collected. Uh, upwards of 30% on some of our larger flocks. I think what's really interesting is we think about our productivity data, okay? Uh, I've told you that we've, we've looked at historical records of how sheep have changed over time, and I, I, I hate hearing when people say, oh, the sheep industry hasn't improved at all. That's not true. Uh, as a whole, our challenges may limit our productivity, but sheep have gotten more productive in the United States of America, more so even than some of our competitors. But what was your, your lambing rate? This would have been for last lambing season. And again, this is calculated as the number of lambs born per ewes exposed to the rent, not number of lambs born per ewe lamb, lambing, okay? because the use exposed have costs too. We have to calculate it on that level. So uh, again, this represents all shapes and sizes, but the average was 149% lambing rate, or you could call it a drop rate. The high was 220%, okay? Docking rate, you can see those. So as you look through these tables, and I believe these are included, are they in your handout? If they're not, shame on me, I'm failing, okay? So you can take a photo of this. The point is, is we need your participation. And if you will leave me your email and you haven't already participated, it's a questionnaire. I know sometimes we're not comfortable sharing it. It comes to me, I'm not sharing, I'm not saying, oh, here's what Marvin's doing and here's what Dr. Pete's doing, you go get Marvin. We're not doing that, okay? Uh, but we need data to compare ourselves in the sheep industry. If we don't, we don't know where to improve. Uh, I will share some of these over the next little bit, but everyone wants to know how they did compared to their neighbor on what they sold lambs for, right? Whoever wonders if you're getting the right price for your lambs? Come on, everybody should be raising their hands, right? Okay, all right, good. We're being honest as I wrap up here. Um, again, I don't share it. When I get a call from you, I don't say, oh, well, Liz just sold her lambs for this much. You should be getting more for your lambs and wool. I want to compile this information so that you can go to the website and say, okay, I'm trending upwards or downwards, or my costs are going out of control compared to my, my neighbor. But this is kind of what we sold lambs for this last year. It was a good year. Um, we're killing the lamb of year lambs that, that some of you donated to today in Fresh Colorado. And they're going to be great prices. Um, I, I will end on this note to say that I think the, sheep, the future of the sheep industry is bright. Our input costs are a challenge. Labor's a challenge. We face pressures, and we always have, but we're dealing with a livestock species that just is naturally programmed to produce with low inputs. And so as you think about um, how are you wanting to improve in this calendar year, I think a good way is participating in this survey and so that we can get this information back to you. With that, I know I'm out of time. I'm definitely out of time. Let's visit out in the NHL area, but thanks for being here. Appreciate all you do, and uh, we'll talk to you here shortly.